Hey guys, today, hello, how are you? Um, I'm studying men like trees. It really is what came out of a study called the lesson from the fig tree. And this is in Matthew 24, verse 32, uh, where he talks about uh, the fig tree. So I'll just read it here quickly. Verses 32 to 35. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out leaves, you know that summer is near. See also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Right, so first of all, this would all happen um, in this generation. He said in verse 34, uh, heaven and earth, this sort of represented the old covenant system, the law of Moses system. Uh, and right after this, he says, concerning that day and hour, no one knows. So we, we don't know the day or the hour, but we know the season in which he came. And since it already happened, then we can know the hour, sort of, of which it came through history books and Josephus. Um, but today's study, let's just stick to the lesson from the fig tree. What does that mean? Um, in a lot of futurist eschatology, they actually use this to say, oh, that the fig tree represents Jerusalem. And in 1948, when it got its independence, that was the fig tree bearing its leaves again. Uh, he said, so we'll know that it is near. And that's also been used to say that, oh, this was the beginning of of initiation of a period where the book of Revelation would finally be fulfilled. Uh, it doesn't really make sense when he says it would happen in this generation, not in that generation, he says in this generation, which everywhere else in the Bible is taken as that time in which he's living in and those people around him at their age, that generation, would not pass away. Um, okay. So, first of all, through nature, the Bible teaches us, right? So, I want to see the parallel gospel, actually, what it says there. Let's go Luke 21 and verse 29 to 30. And he told them a parable, look at the fig tree and what? All the trees. So, it says all the trees in this parallel synoptic gospel. And summer is near. Summer indicating Harvest time, right? You know that summer is already near. So harvest time would be when it would come. And if you've seen my study on the harvest, you'll know, oh, the harvest happened in AD 70, right? Uh, Enoch, chapter 82, verse 17. I won't show that today because I don't have that on this Bible app. Uh, it says, but the trees of the winter season become withered, right? And that should be sort of obvious, is in the winter season, the trees become withered, right? And you don't even have to read the book of Enoch to understand that, but it's in there. It's in this understanding, right? John chapter 15, let's go there now, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So, who are the branches in this verse? It says, as a branch cannot bear fruit. So, the branches are believers. Believers need to abide in Jesus Christ in order to bear fruit. Huh. Now we're getting somewhere with this lesson, right? When had all the trees put out their leaves? Let's go see Revelation 22, verse 2. In the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So the leaves on these trees are for the healing of what? The nations. Right? Now let's see what happened. Did the nations get healed 
Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 6. Which has come to you as indeed the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the God, grace of God in truth. So the gospel had been bearing fruit throughout the whole world and increasing. So we know that it was healing the nations, right? It was this process was already beginning when Colossians was written in this in this period between Jesus' ministry and the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, it was between 50 and 60 AD when Colossians was believed to be written. Uh, let's go Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. For this is he who has spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So here is talking about John the Baptist. This was being fulfilled by the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Jesus quotes Isaiah, which continues on to say, if you look at this verse that he's quoting in Isaiah, it says, we are oaks of righteousness and a planting of the Lord. So, here he said, let's just do the cross reference. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Right after that, he says, every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain hill made low, the uneven ground shall become level. It's rough places, a plain. Right? Was this actually a physical thing that happened? No, but it was being fulfilled spiritually. There's these kingdoms that were being brought low, and there's God's kingdom was being raised up. Um, verse 5, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That was supposed to happen at Jesus' second coming. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken, right? They said it was preached to the whole world, all flesh is going to see it. Um, <clears throat> verse 6. Voice cries, What shall it cry? All flesh is grass, and its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. Surely sure the people are grass. So people are grass in this one, right? Mm, but what does it say, right? Let's keep reading. You attend his flock like a shepherd, so now we're lambs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I just want to find this. to confirm it for you guys. He seeks out the skillful. Okay, I'm just going to look up this verse, actually. Um, planting of the Lord, oaks of righteousness. So it's Isaiah... Uh, 61, actually. So maybe I got this wrong. Oh, no. John. Let's go to Isaiah 61 and look at that for a second. So it says here, Spirit of the Lord, the God is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to the, those who are bound, right? So this was actually the most, first verse Jesus quotes. And uh, it wasn't actually uh, one about John the Baptist. This was when he stood up in Luke chapter 4. And... Uh, so he's, he's declaring the day of the Lord's favor and the vengeance of our God. Uh, strangers shall tend your flocks. 
but you shall be called priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. They shall have everlasting joy. And right, it was verse 3. The oil of gladness. And they shall may be called, what? Oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Right, so God gets his glory when we are oaks of righteousness. And what was happening in the first century? They were being becoming oaks of righteousness right up until we can see in Hebrews, they were given the mature food and they were becoming these oaks of righteousness right at the destruction of Jerusalem. God was being glorified and they were being saved out of that destruction. Um, and so let's go to Luke chapter 6. Four actually first. Mm-hmm. So he was yeah he was or maybe it's verse six chapter six. Mm-hmm. Blessed are you, where is it? Let's go verse 43, actually. For no good tree, what bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs, right, he's talking about the fig tree again. They're not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. And then what do you say? The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil of his treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So when he's talking about the lesson from the fig tree, he's not talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about the believer bearing the fruit of the spirit for the healing of the nations. That's way more powerful, I think, and way more uh sensible and plain interpretation of the lesson from the fig tree than to say it's the city of Jerusalem gaining its independence in 1948. I don't know. What do you think? Uh, Let's go Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So right The fruit of the Spirit was a sign itself to say, oh, Jesus is about to come. He's about to bring the final judgment on their persecutors. And he's going to establish and consummate the kingdom of God. He's going to sit on his throne. And the new covenant is going to begin, guys. It's good news. So 2 Peter chapter 4. Well, there is no 2 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, by which he has granted us his precious, very great promises, so that through them you may, what? Become partakers of the divine nature, right? So why did he use the example of trees, fig trees? It's because we're partaking in the divine nature. That was his purpose. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire, right? So what I wrote here was, fruit comes through faith and his promises, which included the destruction of physical Jerusalem, the tree which had become unfruitful, right? Uh, physical Jerusalem, the tree which had become fruitful because it was to be chopped down in fulfillment of prophecy. To It was to be pruned, right? Actually, John the Baptist said the axe is already at the uh, root of the tree. He's talking about that kingdom of Jerusalem. I think it was from Daniel where he talks about this big tree being chopped down to just the stump. Uh, so it could reproduce, so it could bear even more fruit. And uh, so he's like, you better repent, you better change the way you think, or you're going to get pruned big time. Uh, Daniel chapter 4 and verse 1. 
Let's go and look at that. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancy the visions of my head alarmed me. Uh, so here he's, is, this is, this whole chapter, I just recommend you read it on your own. Is You could pause the video, just watch it on your own. Uh, he has this vision, verse 10, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. Right, so this was similar to how Satan is actually described in Ezekiel. Um, how he was exalts himself, he exalted himself to the highest place, and he was going to be brought low. So in the same way, this, these old covenant Jews, uh, the physical Jews, were exalt, had exalted themselves to like this highest place, saying we're the best. It was self righteousness, and Jesus came, and he, the axe was at the root of the tree. He chopped them down in eighty seventy after being patient with them for nearly four hundred years, or if you're counting from the beginning of the covenant, fifteen hundred years. Um, when finally God's patience had come to an end, there was no more that he could do, and he had to prune them big time down to the stump in the light of the new kingdom of the new covenant. And, uh, yeah. So a tree was in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven. It was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade, the birds of the heavens lifted, lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. So we even get some of Jesus' parables about the birds and the beasts uh, as representing uh, those who are coming to uh, the holy people and uh, living in, its, in your branches, living within the holy people. Um, and then what happened to this branch? It actually gets chopped down. It says in verse 14, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze. Again, iron was... Rome, from Daniel chapter 2. So the destruction of the holy people had to be tied to Rome and uh, Greece, right? We have the Greece uh, Hellenism there as well. So you can read that on your own more. Let's go to Matthew or John 12, 24. Let's see where Jesus actually talks, mentions this. It says, Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So, yeah. That's why he does it, right? Um, <clears throat> Matthew 16, 25. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So laying, surrendering to God is part of that pruning process and uh, not loving your own life unto death, right? That's how you, it's not, it's no more about selfish ambition. It's about love and love keeps no record of wrongs. Love always gives, love always perseveres. And it's through setting your mind on things above, renewing your mind, that we can actually bear the fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus is teaching us how to do that. It was backwards to physical kingdoms. Because in the spiritual kingdom, you actually, it's, it's self-control. You're actually lowering yourself on the social ladder so that God can exalt you, right? So that you can 
know the truth and you can be free. And uh, it, this applies to man. So th this isn't just a story of history. This is a moral story as well. And uh, let's see Mark chapter 8, verse 24. And this is the last verse. He looked up and said, so Jesus heals a blind man in Bethsaida, right? He took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village, and when he had spit on his eyes and laid hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people, but they look like, what? Trees, walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. So the point here is obviously he saw trees before his sight was restored. Now, this is almost the only account we find of Jesus having to pray twice for somebody to be healed. So I, I'm thinking like Jesus was actually showing him the spiritual realm. And then he was showing restoring him back to the earthly realm and the uh, the flesh that he was that was normal right um, so I anyway, I just think that's cool that that's in the Bible like why didn't it just say oh it Jesus prayed a second time or did it just skip that right it, man didn't see fully why didn't you say that but instead it says I see people but they look like trees walking huh Something to think about. So the natural things came first, and then the spiritual, right? So that was that would be another study I recommend. I don't know if I've made it yet, but it's a pretty common thing you can see through the Bible is how the natural, and the physical shadow of the Old Testament pointed to the spiritual realities uh, of morality and also uh, these things that would happen uh, in the New Testament times. So, yeah. Thank you and have a good night.